Welcome to Battling and Beating Cancer. Uh, it's a thrill for Charlene and I to have on our second episode of this program, Dr. Leo Gordon. Dr. Gordon is the Abby and John Friend Professor of Cancer Research, Professor of Medicine and Director of, Lymphoma, of the Lymphoma Program at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University. Uh, Dr. Gordon has been affiliated with Northwestern since 1979, even though he doesn't quite look that old. But Dr. Yeah. Uh, Gordon is uh, one of the premier uh, clinicians and researchers in the area of lymphoma. And I don't want to spend uh, our entire show going through his credentials. I think it's suffice it to say that Dr. Gordon has been and is on uh, every major uh, organization association that's involved with blood cancer and just a uh, prolific author of reports, research studies, editorials, reviews, chapters, and books. And uh, uh, what I want to say, in addition to welcoming you, Dr. Gordon, and thanking you for joining us, is something that doesn't appear in your bio. But uh, to get into the uh, Lymphoma Hall of Fame, the credentials are a necessity, but they're not enough. And the reason you're a Hall of Fame member in our, in our eyes is because of the phenomenal person that you are, the way that you treat and care for your patients, and your commitment uh, to your patients and to all people that are battling blood cancer. And uh, you and your lovely wife, Linda, have been involved uh, in different fundraising and organizational events, even when you haven't been the recipient of them, uh, and have given so much of your time because of your investment in helping people with cancer. And uh, we always say you have to get somebody who's top in terms of credentials, but when you can get somebody who has the credentials, who has the technical skills, and also cares about his patients, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you, Scott. That's, those are kind words. I appreciate that. And I can't tell you, you know, Charlene and I have had the privilege of uh, people who are looking for doctors and, and sometimes fall in, into the wrong hands or not the optimal hands. And I can't tell our audience uh, just what a pleasure it is to work with Dr. Gordon and somebody that is there whenever his patients need them and uh, just a terrific person as well as doctor. And so Thank you. I don't want you Appreciate to, it. if I keep this up, then you'll, you'll, your head will be too big and you won't come <laughs> right. in future programs. Right. But right. Uh, No, I'll always be there for programs. And just one final thing is when the Warners and Charlie and I said that we wanted to start the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and we wanted to do something that's really innovative in terms of expediting the road to better treatments and curing lymphomas, mm -hmm. we were thrilled that you and Northwestern joined us because uh, we've had a long-standing relationship and we know that when we give money to you and to this institution, it's going to be used well, it's not going to be spent on administration, it's going to be spent on cutting edge. Uh, cogent research programs that will benefit all of us because really research is the ticket to all of our long-term survival, isn't right. it? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, clear. there's no question that the, any advances we're going to make in, in lymphomas and any of the blood cancers or in any malignancy is going to come through understanding the basic science but also being able to translate it to the bedside. I mean, I think that um, I think you need to have uh, the basic understanding, the basic molecular biology of this to know where to go, uh, but you have to also be thinking uh, sort of what's the prize? I mean, you have to be thinking about the end result and that is, as I've said, I think improving the outcome of patients with lymphoma. Um, and ultimately, the way we're going to do that is to cure it, uh, but while we're getting there, we're going to improve the outcome. I mean, that's really the, that's really the idea behind all this. Let's just take a, a little step back, we're going to focus on lymphoma, but there are three main forms of blood cancer, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma. Could you just briefly uh, tell us about them and their differences? Sure, and they're sometimes confused, and understandably so, because they do intermingle a little bit. They're all uh, malignancies, cancers of the uh, blood system, uh, so blood cancers. Uh, lymphoma uh, probably starts in the lymphatic system, in the, in, in, but the lymphatic system is part of what we call the hematopoietic system, which is uh, the blood and blood forming organs. So the blood is formed in the bone marrow, um, and the blood forming organs include the bone marrow, the liver, the spleen, uh, to some degree. So these are malignancies that tend to involve the bone marrow, the liver, the spleen, uh, and the lymph nodes. So lymphoma tends to usually show up in lymph nodes. 
Um, and in certain types of lymphoma, it might involve the bone marrow, maybe 60, 70 percent of the time. And in somewhat, somewhat less often, it actually involves the blood. So you actually can see lymphoma cells circulating in the bloodstream. And that happens when the marrow gets sort of overpopulated with the malignant cells, and those cells tend to spill out into the bloodstream. So how is that different from, from leukemia? Well, first of all, there are many, many different types of leukemia. There's acute leukemia, uh, there are chronic leukemias, and there are different types of acute and chronic leukemias. But those are disorders that usually start in the bone marrow, as opposed to, say, starting in the lymph nodes. They can secondarily go to lymph nodes, but they tend to start in the bone marrow. And because they start in the bone marrow, you, you almost always see some spillover into the bloodstream. So people think of leukemia as disorders where you see the abnormal cells in the blood and in the bone marrow. Uh, in lymphoma, you see them in the lymph nodes and often in the bone marrow and sometimes in the blood. But you can have uh, leukemias where the disease is present in lymph nodes as well as in the blood. You can have lymphomas where the disease is present in lymph nodes, but also present in the blood. So there is a lot of overlap between them. Myeloma is a disease similar in many ways. I think we tend to think of myeloma as, I kind of th think of it a little bit as a lymphoma that has differentiated into its end cell. Uh, so lymphomas start with cells that are sort of growing up and somewhere early in the course of their development something goes awry and they form lymphomas. Uh, in myeloma the cell has developed almost to maturity. It's almost gotten to where it wants to go and that last step something goes awry. And myelomas uh, present almost always in the, in the bone marrow, um, but you also, as opposed to lymphomas and leukemias, you see destruction of bone. And it's probably because of substances that are secreted by these um, myeloma cells that cause damage and weakening to the bone. And so very often in myeloma, patients will have back pain or uh, indicating some abnormality in the spine or they may have uh, pain in an extremity in an arm or a leg or they may have a fracture of an arm or a leg that occurs spontaneously or after minor trauma and you sort of accidentally find that there is a defect in the bone on an x-ray and if you biopsy that area in the bone you'll see myeloma cells if you then look in the bone marrow in other places, you'll find these myeloma cells circulating in the bone marrow. And then finally, the sort of other marker for myeloma that doesn't usually happen in leukemias or lymphomas is that these um, myeloma cells produce an excess amount of a certain protein. Uh, it's actually a normal protein. It could be a normal protein, but in myeloma, that protein is abnormal because it's an extra amount and it's produced uh, in a certain way that results in a very, very high level. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that, that uh, there are a lot of similarities, there are a lot of overlap between uh, leukemias, lymphomas, and myelomas. And I think people sometimes have a hard time understanding those differences, and I can understand that because there's so many, they overlap in so many ways that uh, if you try and put them into, into categories, it's a little bit hard to do. And right, I, like yeah. CL, some people consider it a leukemia, some people consider it a lymphoma, a lymphoma. and it's really a hybrid. It's really a hybrid. I, I think I view that's a good example, actually, of a hybrid disease. And some of it is just um, at institutions that study these a lot, they, they may have studied them in their leukemia department. So in that institution, it's considered a leukemia. Some places they studied in their lymphoma department. and. Uh, uh, it's thought of as a lymphoma because if you if you see, in CLL for example you have an elevated white blood count that's often how it presents um, but most patients with CLL also have enlarged lymph nodes so if you happen to see somebody uh, say with CLL but the diagnosis happens to have been made on a lymph node you're going to think of it as a small lymphocytic lymphoma uh, if the diagnosis happens to have been made on the bloodstream you think of it as chronic lymphocytic leukemia I kind of view small lymphocytic lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia as really one disease. So I think of it as SLL, CLL, or CLL, SLL. Um, and I think some of the treatments are, are really quite 
similar. I mean, and I think they should evolve in a similar way. Now, it may be that as we understand the molecular biology of these a little bit more, we'll begin to understand, well, why does it show up more in the blood in some patients and more in the lymph nodes in other patients? Um, those are things we're going to begin to understand in the future, I think. And to make the confusion even worse, it's not uncommon for uh, blood cancers to transform, start out one way and maybe start out as a lymphoma and wind up being a leukemia. That's right, exactly. Um, some, so, for example, there are patients with CLL uh, who uh, have had maybe CLL for many years and are stable and things are going well that suddenly uh, may develop an enlarged lymph node somewhere in the neck or under the arm. And if you do a biopsy, you may find one of a number of things. One of them is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a, a typical large cell lymphoma, and the other is actually Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease. Uh, and we've seen patients, uh, many patients, who have had that combination of either CLL and large cell lymphoma transformation or CLL to Hodgkin's transformation. Um, and those uh, are a challenge because you begin to think of, you treat them more like the more aggressive disease, more like the Hodgkin's or the, uh, or the large cell lymphoma. But then the question becomes, well, what do you do about the underlying CLL? Uh, how, do you, how do you fit that in to the treatment algorithm? And that's the thing that people are still working on. We don't have one answer to that, to that question. So as to confuse our uh, audience even further, focusing in on the umbrella of lymphoma, uh, you mentioned there's two major forms, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin. When I started dealing with this about a dozen years ago, I think we were told there was about three dozen forms of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and now we're told there's about 60 or more forms yeah. of non-Hodgkin right. lymphoma. Right. And it's a mixed blessing. On one hand, the more you're able to get the answers and uh, dis distinguish between different forms, the more you're able to focus the research on particular things. But the mixed blessing is that then the drug companies obviously have a financial incentive to focus in on those lymphomas impacting the greatest number of people. Right. And that's a particularly important role for private funding and private institutions to zero in on not only focusing on the lymphomas that may not have as large numbers associated to it, but the treatments that may overlap and there's a great deal of synergy. Right. Absolutely. Well, first of all, just to, to go back a little bit, so there are about uh, anywhere from eight, maybe 9,000 cases a year of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we, we call it now Hodgkin's lymphoma. It used to be called Hodgkin's disease. And I, I still sort of think of it as Hodgkin's disease. I think the reason we're calling it Hodgkin's lymphoma now is because we've recognized that it's got many features that are in common with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we think that the, we never used to understand what the abnormal cell is, was we now understand that it's probably a B cell that goes awry in some way. So. Hodgkin's is probably more similar to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma than we thought that it was, and maybe in some ways it's even a variant of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, there are about 8,000 cases a year. It tends to occur in younger people, people in their 20s and 30s, but again, people in their 60s and 70s also, but much more common in, in younger people. The non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they're now in the United States expected this year to be about 60,000 or more cases, so it's a much more common disease. And as you said, there are many, many forms and varieties of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, and as we understand more about the disease, we're going to probably subdivide it even further. We're going to start looking at molecular signatures that may divide these even more. One of the projects in our grant, actually, is to look at a new technology called microRNA. We were looking at genes before, and now we're looking at something called these micro, tiny little microRNA particles that may even be more important than, than the, the genes that were identified by gene array studies, which have been so important over the last five years or so. Um, I think these microRNA may be a, a sort of a new advance, and we can make distinctions between these even better using this uh, new technology. With regard to what you said about, and you're right, what you said about um, incentives and rare diseases, one of the things that we've begun to sort of recognize, the NIH has had for many years a, 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 a program in rare diseases. Um, so there, they have a special uh, sort of set aside, if you will, to study rare diseases. And we've never 
thought about the lymphomas as rare diseases because when you have 60,000 cases a year, it's not necessarily a rare disease. But if you then start subdividing and looking at mantle cell lymphoma, uh, making up maybe two or three percent of all those, and marginal zone lymphoma making up a small percentage, and Burkitt's lymphoma, 2,000 cases a year in the United States. Um, I think each of the lymphomas in many ways qualifies as a rare disease. So I think we're, we're making some uh, movements toward involving this rare disease group at the National Institute of Health to help us uh, to study these diseases as specifically rare diseases, not just as a big category of lymphomas, but as mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, those kinds of things. So I think I'm hoping that, that the, the drug companies will begin to recognize that also. And, um, you know, the, the problem is in, in large clinical trials, a drug gets approved for follicular lymphoma and um, where we know it's going to work just as well in marginal zone lymphoma. We think it probably will. Um, are we going to be running into problems using a certain drug for marginal zone lymphoma when it's approved for just follicular lymphoma? Um, and that's uh, something we're going to have to deal with, I think. At, at a rudimentary level, trying to figure out the signs and the symptoms, because lymphoma uh, is a lot of times tough to diagnose because the symptoms can be variable or they could be almost non-existent. It could be, you know, a cold that doesn't right. seem to go away. It could be night sweats. It could be fever, chills. Right. Uh, but one of the common things is an inflamed lymph node. Right. Uh, right. What what is it that then somebody comes in and you're doing an examination? What clinically are you looking at for a diagnosis, and then what diagnostic tools are commonly used with lymphoma patients? Well, so I think that what you say is all is right. Of course, people can present in many different ways. Sometimes people have a CAT scan for something else, uh, and incidentally, we notice that there is an enlarged, a very large lymph node in the uh, in the abdomen or in the chest area. Um, we've seen uh, people who were going to have heart surgery and they had uh, a CAT scan or an MRI scan of the chest area and lo and behold there's a mass in the chest um, totally uh, unrelated to what you know anybody was looking for but there it is and then you have to start. so so people can be asymptomatic they can be totally without symptoms and you can find it on a, on a scan uh, people can present with, uh, very, on the other side of that coin, people, people can present with fevers and night sweats and 20 pounds weight loss in, a, in two or three months um, and are clearly ill um, and you don't have a reason for it. Uh, on, then when on physical exam you're, you're thinking about lymphoma because those are some of the classic symptoms related to lymphoma and you start looking on exam for enlarged lymph nodes that might be in the neck or they may be under the arms or they may be in the groin or you might find a mass in the abdomen on physical exam that you would then follow up with a scan to look for it. But I think that the key to the diagnosis is a biopsy and uh, you know I think that once you see an enlarged lymph node that's larger than you think it should be and that's sometimes a gray area because people can have some slight enlarged lymph nodes uh, for many many different reasons uh, I guess if you biopsy every one of those you'd be biopsying a lot of normal lymph nodes so you have to have some suspicion either some symptoms or the node is a little bit larger than it should be um, and that's just a gestalt that's just a feeling um, and then what's key I think is and this is something that that we're trying to remind people about is you need good tissue. You need enough tissue to be able to determine the architecture of the lymph node and enough tissue to, to do special studies because sometimes it's not so easy to make the diagnosis to distinguish normal from abnormal. And one um, uh, thing that I've seen a lot of is that we're able now to do these fine needle biopsies and fine needle aspirates on lymph nodes. and. Um, and, and I keep thinking, you know, just because we're able to do it doesn't mean that, that we should do it. Um, to me, that's a waste most of the time. And uh, I, I, for, especially if somebody's thinking about lymphoma. I mean, in particular, if somebody's thinking about lymphoma. So I would uh, encourage physicians and, and patients not to sort of, if there's a lymph node that's accessible, 
um, it should be biopsied. It should be either removed or a portion of it should be removed so we have enough tissue to make a good diagnosis. And then, of course, to learn more about it, but mostly to make a good diagnosis. That's really the, the key. Um, so you need to have a surgeon that you're used to working with that knows how to biopsy these lymph nodes. And then you need to work with a group of pathologists um, that have special expertise in this area. I mean, these are hemato, what are called hematopathologists. All they do is look at lymph nodes and bone marrows and blood. They don't, they're not looking at anything else. That's all they do. Um, and I think it's important for any patient who is um, being diagnosed, uh, sees their physician, has the biopsy done, uh, the question to ask is, was this reviewed by an experienced hematopathologist? And if it wasn't, then it should be. There's no reason that these slides can get sent to, to somebody that does nothing but that. And I find very often, actually, that when we see a patient for a second opinion, which we do a lot, uh, I think the most valuable thing that we do is get the slides, look at them with our pathologists, and it's really the pathologist that's doing most of the work. You know, I think that you know we sometimes make some suggestions, but more often than not, we're making some revisions about the diagnosis or confirming the diagnosis or saying, well, it's not this, it's this. And that's where the pathologist comes in. And so that, that which is a critical point, because everybody knows, I think by now, the importance of getting a second opinion, no matter how much confidence you have in the first doctor, the first institution, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with something major like cancer, get a second opinion. But part of that second opinion, get the tissue. Right. Get, uh, get the actual scans, not right. just the reports. Not the reports. I, I think that's so important because, you know, somebody comes and says, they get, I get a report, they say, they says this is uh, follicular lymphoma. And they say, well, do you agree with that? So, well, all I can do is read the report here. I mean, I don't have the slides to look at. So I agree that the report says it's follicular lymphoma, but I don't know what the slides say. So I need to look at the slides under the microscope. And I think that anybody, I think in any malignancy, anybody that's got a diagnosis of a, any kind of malignancy, be it lung or breast or stomach or wherever, if they're getting an opinion, get the slides. That's a, a key part of any kind of second opinion for blood cancers and for non-blood cancers. All right, so now the patient's at the point where they've got an opinion, they've got a second opinion, and they've got a diagnosis. And of course, we talked about you're diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's not enough for the patient to know that or for the doctor because there's a lot of forms in the prognosis, the treatment options vary with that. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, when I first uh, heard lymphoma, well, I didn't like it. I didn't like how it was spelled. I didn't like how it sounded. Right. And right. then I was told, and it was better than the alternative diagnosis of a germ cell tumor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then I was told, well, you have aggressive lymphoma. And of course, right away, being Mr. Positive, I said, well, oh, aggressive, that's bad. Mm -hmm. But as it turns out, that was probably a good thing good in my thing. case. Right. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit. In, you know, this could be an hour segment in itself, but just sure. briefly a little bit about some of the different forms, forms. the indolent versus. So I think that, that uh, you know, say 60,000 cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma a year. Um, and there are, as you said, many, many different types. But I think for practical purposes, you can divide those into two major types. There are aggressive lymphomas and there are indolent lymphomas or non-aggressive lymphomas, if you will. And there is a very different natural history between the two. And really, the, the major discussion that you have with people who want to get opinions about this has to do with that sort of dichotomy. Is it aggressive? Is it not aggressive? And how do you approach it? Uh, if it's aggressive, how do you approach it if it's not aggressive? So start with aggressive lymphomas. I think that there's kind of, in a way, kind of good news and bad news to both in, in many ways. Um, the aggressive lymphomas, uh, need to be treated aggressively because if they're not treated aggressively with usually chemotherapy now in, in 2010 um, and actually chemotherapy plus rituxan. Rituxan is going to be part of the treatment of, of almost every um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and it, so those are patients that need to be treated if not treated, the disease can progress, sometimes rapidly, sometimes not so rapidly, but it will ultimately progress. The good news is that if it's treated, um, a large uh, majority of patients achieve a complete remission, 
and the large majority of those patients stay in remission. So after maybe six cycles of a traditional chemotherapy regimen, say it's rituxan with CHOP as an example, um, and CHOP is the acronym for a group of four drugs, uh, and we tend to throw these acronyms around as everybody knows them, but it's cytoxin, adromycin, vincristine, and prednisone with rituxan. Rituxan is the R in the R-CHOP regimen. Uh, we the adromycin is the, the red is the red medication. That, and in my case, they administered everything intravenously except that one. They put in a big tube and they pumped they it pumped in. Pumped it in, yeah. And I remember I was going for my first session, and I said, "I'm getting nauseous. I'm getting nauseous." And the mm -hmm. chemo nurse said, "No, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay." Right. I wasn't. It was like wasn't, wind of yeah. blare, but that's right. why I remember that. And I think that's also a common reason or the, the drug that may be the suspect for patients who lose their hair. Is right, it? right. I mean, adromycin is a drug that causes hair loss. It can, in the long term, if you're getting it indefinitely, it can cause some heart damage. And see, we're always looking out for the heart when we're giving adromycin. The H in the CHOP is the adromycin, so you wonder why is it H. It's hydroxydonomycin is the, is the actual name of it, and that's where the H fits in better to the, to the acronym. But So that we know can result in remissions in the majority of patients, and those remissions will last in the majority of patients, but there are some prognostic factors that go into this. So we know that if you're under 60 and you don't have any symptoms and you're LDH level, which I think is one of the most important prognostic factors, is normal and or not too elevated. Um, and you don't have too many sites outside of lymph nodes that are involved, uh, you'll have a very good outcome, maybe 85-90% uh, cure. Whereas uh, if you have many of the symptoms and you're older and the, 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 the remission rate isn't so high and the cure rate isn't so high. What I would say though, in the rituxan era, in, in the time since rituxan has been introduced, even in the worst case scenario, um, more than 55% of patients are cured uh, with the first chemotherapy uh, course, Reg not the first dose, but the first, say, six, six mm -hmm. uh, doses of the drug. Is it drug. still common, uh, back when I was going through it, there was a lot of studies and the, the evidence suggested that even fewer doses of uh, chemotherapies, but coupled with combination radio uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still the course? That's still the course, especially in localized disease. If the disease is in, the, in maybe one or two lymph node sites, we know that we can probably give anywhere from maybe two to three to four at the most cycles with, with radiation. And that's, those results are, are very, very good, very, uh, very positive results. I mean, you, you see 80, 90% of patients that may be cured of their disease. If not, if the disease doesn't respond, or if it returns at some point, uh, and most, if they're gonna return, come back in the first couple of years, um, there are some that still may come back at year three, year four, year five, but it, it decreases each year. Uh, then we have things like bone marrow transplants that we can do, um, and they can be cured in, in more than half the patients also still. So I think there's, uh, good optimism with the with the large aggressive lymphomas, and so the other thing we're recognizing now is that there are certain markers um, that we didn't know about two years ago that turn out to be important in predicting which chemotherapy regimen you should use. So, for example, there's a marker called CMYC, mm -hmm. which uh, is present in some lymphomas. It's not present in other lymphomas. There's a very nice report from the British Columbia group, the pathology group at British Columbia that looked at a group of patients with CMYC and without CMYC, and it turns out that if you have the CMYC rearrangement, the CMYC expressed, um, CHOP doesn't work so well. So maybe we should be using a different regimen instead of CHOP. Uh, and so those some, these are some of the things we're going to be learning or we're learning now as to how to sub begin to subdivide and how that subdivision is going to impact treatment. So the large cell lymphomas, the optimism is that, that the majority are, can be cured. Um, but the treatment is not easy for, for some of those patients. The follicular lymphomas is the group of patients with the most common type of indolent lymphoma or slow growing or non-aggressive lymphoma. And there's a good news and a bad news to that also. The, <clears throat> the, the bad news, I suppose, is that it's a chronic disease, at least with conventional treatments. So when I say it's a chronic disease, I mean it's a chronic disease like diabetes might be a chronic disease or like chronic lung disease, or like chronic heart disease, or like rheumatoid arthritis. It's a disease you can have for your life, 
Um, you can treat it, you can get rid of it, but it has a tendency to return. Um, it may not be something that might be fatal necessarily. Uh, it may be something that you can live with, like you live with diabetes. Um, uh, so that's, I suppose, the bad news. The good news is that many patients, because if they don't have symptoms, the disease isn't growing rapidly, may not need any treatment at all. And there's a sort of a hard part to this, I think, that you, you say to patients, well, you have lymphoma, but we're going to watch. And we say we're so going to... it's watch and wait to some people, and to some other people it's watch and worry because they worry. know they've got cancer and they want to do something. Right, and that's a hard part of this. And But we've seen patients who are you know, 10, 12, 15 years later and we still haven't done any treatment, they haven't needed any treatment uh, because the disease hasn't changed very much. And sometimes it does grow and, and when it gets to a certain point, we'll say, well, this may be the time that we should start treating. I think the other thing that we have to look out for is, is it transforming? I mean, sometimes when we need to start treatment, say it's grown more quickly recently, we want to do a rebiopsy to see if it's still follicular lymphoma. And if it is, then we treat it that way. And the treatment for follicular lymphoma might be rituxan alone, or it might be rituxan together with certain chemotherapy agents. Uh, some, a lot of people are using the same treatment as we use for large cell lymphoma, rituxan CHOP, whether that's uh, the best or not. For some people it is, for some it may not be. There are people that we've given just rituxan that are doing just fine. Um, there's some data suggesting that giving rituxan as a maintenance might be beneficial, and we do that in some in some patients actually. And so rituxan, which in some ways has really been a wonder drug for mm -hmm. a lot of people, because I think that and that in combination with uh, radioactive isotopes, the mm -hmm. Bexar, Zevlin, as right. the drugs are called, right. have at least for patients that I've known and some of whom I know you treat, right. uh, you know, may have traditionally been thought, well, we'll treat you, we'll keep you alive for a long time, but it's going to get you. And now they're experiencing remissions and no active disease for periods of 10, 15 years. Exactly. Right. And some people are keeping their fingers crossed and saying, maybe some of these lymphomas that we thought were incurable now are Might curable. be curable, in fact. And so you, you mentioned radioimmunotherapy. So we've taken rituxan, which we know works well, but if you have a large mass of tumor, large tumor, that rituxan can't necessarily get to the middle of that tumor. It can maybe get to the outside of it, but can't get to the middle of it because it sticks to the outside cells. Well, if you then arm that rituxan or, or, or uh, with a radioactive compound, either um, radioactive iodine, which is Bexar, or radioactive yttrium, which is Zevalin, um, both of those are radioactive compounds, and then what happens is the rituxan sticks to the tumor, but the radioactivity gets to the, to the more cells. And it's like a Trojan horse kind of thing. You're taking the drug to the, to the tumor, and then you're releasing sort of an army of radioactivity against it. And the, uh, the, the nice part of it is that the radioactivity goes only to the lymphoma cells, and it spares most, not completely, but spares most normal cells from a high dose of radiation. So we have patients that we started I think it's now been 13, maybe years ago or so, uh, that were on some of the first trials of radioactive radioimmunotherapy, and they're still doing well without problems, without any evidence of recurrence. And not to get too far off the subject, mm -hmm. but uh, an interesting point, and we write about it, is that uh, uh, here we have a drug that is, or a treatment that is curative or potentially curative for cancers that at one time, not too many years ago, were thought not to be. And not only do you have the science aspect of having to develop these treatments, but you've got a few things uh, that are standing in the way of this drug perhaps being used as often as it should be because of the radi radioactive component. Right. A lot of local hospitals are, don't have the capability to do it. Right. There are a bunch of economic issues associated with its affordability. Right. And a couple years ago, a bunch of us were uh, doing battle with the federal government that was threatening its existence right. by its Medicaid reimbursement program. So. Right. It's a role, I think it's another area where doctors and people impacted by the disease have to work together not only to bring these drugs to market, but keep them out there. Absolutely, the advocacy groups uh, in that area, in radioimmunotherapy and getting the Medicaid and Medicare to understand uh, how this worked and that this wasn't your average drug, this wasn't like other drugs, um, uh, was key to getting some of the rules changed. And I think right now, from what I can see, I think things are okay, at least for the moment, in terms of reimbursement for this. Um, I think we still have to get more oncologists experienced in using it, but I think uh, once that happens, I think you'll see some 
some continued good results, especially in the low-grade lymphomas. We just uh, published a study looking at it, uh, r the radioimmunotherapy together, together with an agent called MGD, which is a uh, radio sensitizer. So we're hoping that we can improve the outcome of radioimmunotherapy by making it work better by giving another drug which sensitizes cells to radiation. So, uh, I mean, those are things that are studies that are going to continue to go on. Uh, hopefully, they'll, they will. So, bigger picture, mm -hmm. and my numbers are probably uh, less accurate than, than what you have, but there's about 500,000 Americans battling lymphoma. Nearly a million Americans living with some form of blood cancer. I think 20,000 will die this year alone of lymphoma. And you, as you say, another 60,000 diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, so the numbers are staggering. Right. I think uh, blood cancers account for nearly 10% of the cancers diagnosed in the U.S. Right. And you look at that, you look at the, the fact that it's the blood cancers are the most common cancers in children. You look and you say non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, while many most cancer rates have fallen, the rate of incidence on Hodgkin's lymphoma has nearly doubled since the 1970s. Right. So there's a lot of reason to be invested in, in uh, lymphoma and blood cancer oh, research. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in terms of survival rates, and you know, as a doctor you probably deal with patients differently based on their mindset. Some people want to know, some people mm -hmm. don't want to know. Right. Charlene and I were always of the camp, we want the information we want to know. Right. And I think when we first started out, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, 85% uh, cure rate, mm -hmm. or five year survival rate. Right, right, right. Um, non Hodgkin's overall rate was 56 or so percent. Mm -hmm. I think now overall it's in the 60, 63 yeah, or so. It's probably even maybe a little bit more than that. So now, yeah, we're, we're right. making, making progress in yep. the aggregate. Absolutely. Um, Within non-Hodgkin's, the rates vary considerably because, as you pointed out, some may have cure rates of, of 90%. Right. So the diagnosis, getting it right, is important not only for the prognosis but for the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but I maintain, apart from the million or so people impacted by blood cancer and those who love them, mm -hmm. that blood cancer research is special uh, in, in a few ways from other research First of all, because it involves your immune system. Cancers, while a lot of causes, a lot of etiology is not known, we know that exposure to toxic agents, viruses, bacteria play major roles. Right. But some people are exposed to the same things. Some get cancer, some don't. So the role of the immune system, of which the lymph system is, right. plays a huge role in understanding cancer and understanding and coming up with cures, not only for lymphoma, and blood cancers, but uh, even rituxan, which we talked about, the FDA approved it for some forms of arthritis. Right, right. And uh, I think tamoxifen, which was tried and developed for lymphoma, didn't work, but it's mm -hmm. been used for breast cancer. Right. So we say that lymphoma and blood cancer research is the super highway to curing cancer. And I just like your, your take on that. Well, I think it, it's a good point. I mean, I think that traditionally, first of all, um, when you look back historically, uh, some of the earliest responses were in the blood cancers. They were in children with acute leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia. The study, the, the sort of landmark studies from St. Jude's um, uh, on children with acute leukemia. Uh, the studies in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering and at Mount Sinai and at the National Cancer Institute um, in Hodgkin's disease and in certain types of leukemia. Those diseases responded better to some of the agents that we have, so they became diseases to study, first of all. And then second of all, the staging system in diseases like Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma served as kind of a paradigm for the staging for other malignancies. And the whole field of, of oncology, studying breast cancer and lung cancer and, and stomach cancer, um, arose in a way out of the early studies of some of the blood cancers. So just from a clinical standpoint, a lot of what we do in other malignancies is based on what we've done in the blood cancers. And then on the second, for the second uh, important point I think is that the cells in, in leukemias and lymphomas especially, and in myeloma, are readily available for study. In other words, um, they're not necessarily deep-seated, hard to get to, 
you have, if they're in the blood, you can sample the blood and get a blood sample almost any time and do special studies on it. And so it's leading you to be able to test different theories about the immune system and look at the cells and understand what's happening with the cells and why they're dividing, why they're dying, what are the mechanisms which which they die. Um, so I think that also serves as a paradigm for the study of cancer, the blood cancers have done that. So I think you're right. I mean, I think that that it's always been that way, that things started from there. And, and the progress now is being made in other malignancies too, but I think the study of the blood cancers has always been at the forefront of that. 30 plus years <clears throat> helping people with cancer. Uh, give our audience just a few tips. Somebody's diagnosed with lymphoma. Uh, what are some pointers you could give to them to, to help them get on the surviving side of the statistics? Right. Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, we've seen so many people, um, and most of the time it's the other way around. People teach me how to do it. I mean, I, um, I don't know that I could do some of the things that some of the patients, or most of the patients that I see have done, have gone through. Um, you know, I think that having an open dialogue, communication with their physician, be it their oncologist or internist or somebody that they can look to that they can feel comfortable talking and can be available to them. Uh, I think that availability to patients is critical. I think that for patients, they need to find someone that they can feel that they can call when there's a question. Um, I actually think email has been a great advance. I mean, whatever negatives we might want to say about it, I think for patients uh, being able to email questions and uh, you know get an answer back, you know just. Mm -hmm quickly is, is I think it puts people in, in close contact with their physician and so I would suggest that patients ask physicians if they mind using email if they uh, to, to answer their questions um, uh, so I think I think uh, having the support of family uh, and friends is is key uh, having an outlook that really if you're if with say diagnosed with a large cell lymphoma you have to really believe that it's a potentially curable process, potentially curable malignancy. If you're diagnosed with a follicular lymphoma, I think you have to believe that if you're not having symptoms, that a watch and wait approach isn't so much watch and worry. Uh, that's going to take time to get over that. But it's it's watch and wait. And if there's something that develops, um, we uh, it can be treated. We have a young man that we followed and followed for now probably 15 years or so who about maybe seven or eight years ago developed increasing size of a lymph node and we were getting ready to start treatment that thing disappeared by itself uh, you know just just before we were ready to start and it's never come back again so there are spontaneous remissions that can occur not commonly but they can occur in most of the follicular lymphomas um, so which is interesting yeah. because there's a couple patients I have in mind who I, I think you know as well have gone an extended period of time, 15 years without needing mm -hmm. a single treatment, without there being any marked increase in the, in the size of any involvement, who may actually live a normal, full lifespan and never require a single right. treatment. Right, exactly, that's right. All right, so cancer is sort of the great equalizer because there are brilliant minds like yours, there are wonderful people like my wife Charlene and like the Warners, and then there's dopes like me and yet there's something all of us can do to help because uh, we, through the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation, one of our primary missions, actually our primary mission, is to raise money, to put them in the hands of researchers like you. Uh, and really, uh, the two goals for patients, if, if, if they have a disease that's currently not deemed to be curable, mm -hmm. uh, is that there is hope because the longer you stay alive, Right. And through existing treatments, the more likely it is that by the time that treatment isn't working anymore, there'll be another treatment that will. And then by that time, Dr. Leo Gordon and people just like you will find better treatments and cures. So. Well, I, I, people, people after me will, and, and uh, smart, a lot smarter people than me will, that's for sure. But I think that, that uh, it's true. I mean, I think that you have to have that hope and understanding that the progress in this field 
is probably as fast as in any field in, in oncology, um, any field that has to do with, with cancer. I mean, the, the progress has been amazing. And I, as I said earlier, I think there is an inflection point that's going to happen if you, if you kind of plot the, the, the rate of improvement. Um, somewhere around five, eight years ago or so, when we started understanding the genome, um, understanding the molecular biology of these diseases, uh, you're going to start to see the rate of improvement increase pretty, uh, pretty dramatically, I think. So. Well, Doctor, I'm never shy about making predictions, but I am going to predict that during our lifetimes, we're going to see more efficacious treatments across the board for lymphomas, and we're going to see the cure for many forms of lymphoma. And uh, that's what we're working hard to do. If I had the gift to be in the research laboratory helping, I would. I don't. But if we could help get you some money uh, that uh, spearheads that process. And one of the unique things about this partnership, and I think it's special because um, you respect some of the great colleagues of the great minds in Chicago about oh, yeah, cancer absolutely. research. And the fact that you and they are all willing to partner on something for the overall good, I think, is something really special about the quality of care that people with all forms of lymphoma right. uh, can expect and right. continue to expect here in Chicago. So thank you for all that you're you're welcome. Thank you for everything you've done. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm.